Hello and welcome. I'm Professor Gail McPherson, for those of you who don't know me, the Director of the Centre for Culture, Sport and Events. We've obviously had a few technical issues this morning, so I really apologise for that. We're using, we're using a new platform which we thought we were um, going to be smart and use this new fantastic platform, which is really good. It's called Restream Studio, which is amazing. And um, because you are watching it live stream on any one of the four social media platforms, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, any comments or questions that you post on that come directly onto our page so all your speakers can, can see the questions and can answer them and, and we can would respond to them. So thank you very much. We have over 100 people have registered for the conference via Eventbrite today, but of course, many more people can just watch it live stream without um, registering, which is the, the benefit and the joy of these things. This is our third annual conference um, and our second online. We probably hadn't expected to be online again this year, but we are. Um, and hopefully we will be coming out of some sort of lockdown as we're easing a little bit and maybe in the future we'll be able to see you on a face-to-face -face basis as well. Today, we are considering the role of arts and culture festivals in the future of urban spaces in a post-COVID recovery. Uh, this conference has been made possible with the help of UWS and Renfrewshire Council and we are able again to make this free to participate in. Interestingly, whilst many of us would love to meet in person and chat over the tea that's usually too strong and the coffee that's too weak, we're not quite there yet. Looking ahead, I don't think we'll ever do conferences only in person again. And maybe that's a positive that's come out of lockdown. The digital offering has allowed us to reach a far greater audiences, so I think in future, we'll have that mixture of in-person and live stream conferences as standard. So today's conference, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers for you, looking at three main areas of the role of arts and culture and recovery, the role of tourism, events and festivals and renewal post pandemic, and the role of arts and culture to help us reflect, envisage and change what is and what should be normal. Looking there at some of our wellbeing issues and mental health, for example. We also have a video showcase this afternoon, highlighting both academic and student work that has been ongoing with Renfrewshire Council and that has relevance for other local authorities. You're welcome to post questions throughout the day for our panellists and feel, please feel free to dip in and out of the sessions and watch it freely. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank Dr. Sophie Mamata, our research associate, who has led on bringing this conference together with our fantastic PhD students who are chairing this afternoon's sessions and staff at Renfrewshire Council who are working in these key areas. Professor McGilvery will be chairing the first session. And as a reminder, we're using the hashtag CCSE Futures for today, which we'd love you to use and share. And I hope that you enjoy your day. And I can see that already there, um, there are some comments popping up. So yes, David German, thank you very much. It's nice to see you. And where are we? We're, we're reporting from Scotland from another comment there as well. So thank you very much. Perhaps put in the comments where you are watching from and we might be able to see that. So thank you. And without further ado, um, I will hand over to Professor David McGilvery. Thank you very much, Gail, uh, and welcome to everyone that's that's watching and, and listening in. Um, so my name is David McGilvery, and I'm a professor in event and digital cultures, and also the director, a uh, deputy director of the Centre for Culture, Sport, and Events, which is hosting this event. So I'm delighted to be chairing the first session of the day, and it's titled "Recovery, Repair, and Renewal." the role of arts and culture in the future of urban places. So big topic here. Um, so just to give a bit of a setting, uh, we know that towns and cities across the world have sought to invest in, 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 in recent years in the arts, culture and heritage uh, as, a, as a transformative tool for social, but also for economic growth. And um, we know that some have pursued capital of culture bids as a catalyst for the desired transformation, and others have looked to invest in maybe more embedded grassroots approach to cultural regeneration and whichever strategy has been used the intention there is often to grow the visitor economy in each place but also also improving the quality of life which is obviously important for local people living in these environments so the argument goes that these developments can lead to strengthen cultural sector increase civic pride and private sector investment however as we know and we've all experienced covid pandemic has brought significant uncertainty to the economic social but also the cultural future of the towns and cities that we live in. Um, and that raises questions about sustainability of the visitor economy, 
model of transformation, for example, that road to recovery, repair and renewal can take many different forms with decisions being made in this very unpredictable environment. So in this panel, we want to explore the role of arts and culture in the recovery and the repair and the renewal of urban locations as we emerge from what the, the most immediate effects of the COVID pandemic we've been living through. So delighted to have three excellent speakers to discuss these issues with us this morning. Uh, and first up, we're going to hear from uh, Andrew Dixon. Andrew is one of the UK's leading cultural place consultants. He's worked for 20 years in the Northeast as the CEO of Northern Arts, Executive Director for Arts Council England, and also the CEO of Newcastle Gateshead Initiative, where he also took a regional lead for tourism research. He's also well known to, to us all with his work at Creative Scotland. Um, he's worked with over 80 local authorities across the UK, as well as 12 universities and various LEPs, tourism and development agencies, and private developers. Andrew's company, Culture Creativity Place, specializes in place-based cultural development and partnerships. Uh, and he's also advised and led on successful bids for Hull 2017, Coventry 2021 UK City of Culture, Leeds 2023, and York's UNESCO status. <coughs> Secondly, we're going to hear from Louisa Mahon, who's Head of Marketing, Communications and Events at Remshire Council. She's the strategic lead for the Paisley Partnership and also his responsibility for communications and marketing, cultural regeneration, regional destination marketing, and the Council's major events programme, which attracts you know, over 160,000 attendees each year to, to the area. Uh, Louisa Rima also includes overseeing the capital appeal for Paisley Museum, Reimagine, and she led the Paisley's bid for the UK City of Culture 2021 and Paisley's bid to host the Royal National Mod in 2022. Uh, she previously had senior marketing and PR roles in local government and at the Daily Record and the Sunday Mail. And finally, uh, we're going to hear from Gail again, who, who introduced the conference, who's the Chair in Events and Cultural Policy here at UWS. Her research interests revolve around the interventions of the local and national state and wider agencies in events and festivity and the social and cultural impacts of large-scale sports events and communities. She's recently led as the PI and two research projects on the contribution of arts and culture and global security and stability and the inclusive cultural heritage for skills development in Kenya on behalf of the British Council. She's a PI on the Social Value of Community Events Project, which is funded by Spirit 2012 and Local Trust and has a range of external roles, including being a, a legacy and evaluation advisor to Paisley's 2021 UK City of Culture bid team. So, Introducing our speakers, the, the format today is that we've asked speakers to address three main questions and we'll do that in turn, starting with Andrew. Then we'll open up for questions and discussion, so please post these to the comment section of the live feed that you can see. Uh, I'll then direct the end of, as many of these as possible to the speakers and we'll have a hopefully a very fertile discussion. We've got sufficient time, we've got till 12 o'clock for this first session, even though we've had a bit of a, a delay. So without further ado, um, I'm going to ask Andrew to maybe address uh, the first question. And the first question is around about recovery. So welcome, Andrew. And the first question is, what role can arts and culture play in the recovery, both economic and social, from COVID-19? OK, welcome. Uh, I'm here uh, in Edinburgh. Um, I'm going to show you two or three slides, um, not least because I think they show where we've moved from and to. Uh, so if uh, you can share my first slide, David. Um, I, I was involved in the bid for Hull to be UK City of Culture. And uh, uh, part of the bidding is uh, visioning the programme. And you're looking at ways that you can bring people together, that you can tackle issues around isolation, mental health, etc. how you can build pride, community cohesion, all these things which are now problems post-COVID. Um, but my message is that there were always problems, actually. Um, and cities have had to recover from crises in the past, from austerity, uh, from their own social and economic downfall. In Hull, it was a loss of the fishing industry and the docks. Um, and Hull was bottom of every league table, you know, for education, mental health and, and everything. Uh, but I thought it was quite interesting to look back on these images. Um, two of the projects, I suppose, that, that I came up with some of the ideas for were the Spencer Tunic, where 3,700 people were naked and not socially distanced uh, for five hours in iconic locations in the city. And then the opening event, where kind of streams of the heritage and history and stories of place uh, were brought in. And, and over seven days, 340,000 people came to see it. Um, 
So very interesting to look at that and then to look at the almost apocalyptic image of the city getting ready uh, for City Call 2, which could, could well have been COVID. Uh, if we can flip on to the next slide. Um, the next slide, please, David. So the next slide is um, in Coventry. And uh, I was in Coventry last week. Um, I wasn't even allowed to go and see the opening event myself uh, because the police would only allow 30 people in any one place. And the opening event had to use secret locations, had to move around the city very fast, um, uh, but still engage sort of four or 500 people from different communities. Um, and uh, the engagement had to be in different ways. So 70 schools involved in this sort of flag installation in the city centre and the transformation in Coventry is actually more impressive than Hull. Um, uh, what City of Culture is doing for uh, regeneration in, in Coventry for uh, connecting communities is really impressive. This is a city uh, where 27% of the population was born outside of the UK. Um, this is a city that's seven years younger than the rest of the UK. It's a city that's sort of beyond diversity and definitions of diversity. Um, and it's a city that's had a sort of reputation for humanity and reconciliation. Uh, and actually, it's a city that's really well prepared, uh, regardless of city culture, to deal with COVID and to deal with all the kind of issues of isolation, of health, of loss of retail, of um, uh, meeting places disappearing. Um, so I, it was quite interesting to contrast it with Hull. And if we go to my final slide. Um, so I'm, I was reflecting on what the kind of key issues were um, for today and with three questions, but um, everybody talks about health, everybody talks about resocialization, and everybody talks about, you know, what's to, what's going to happen to town centres, what's going to happen to the economy and tourism jobs. Uh, but I think when we get into the depth of this, um, the issues are more profound than that and uh, are, are deeper. And they're about um, a sort of, not a generational loss, because it's only been 18 months, but a significant loss in the engagement with where we live and the engagement with the people that we live in, um, the engagement with the stories and the places where we live. Um, the arts have spent 20, 30 years developing audiences. You know, every theatre has an audience development plan. We've just set it back 30 years and we've got to have a completely different approach. Um, and all of this is in the context that, yes, um, cities have been hit by uh, the economics of COVID, but actually individuals have been hit harder, and particularly artists and freelancers, and many people have, have lost their their incomes. Um, so for me, the role that the arts can play in, in social and economic recovery, it, it's multifaceted. It, it, it's about rethinking um, where we live and how we live, uh, rethinking what, what towns and cities are for. You know, town centres have had um, a reputation, you know, they started, I suppose, as meeting places where people came and traded cattle. This is a time when most people grew their own food. Uh, and there were places where money exchanged. There were, above all else, there were meeting places where you met people at the butchers, the bakers, the grocers, the ironmongers. Um, but now gone are those towns and cities uh, which were um, homogenous, that had Woolworths, Boots and Debenhams. Um, they might still have Primark and Sports Direct, but actually um, arts and culture can play a role in kind of redefining the independence of, of cities and places, redefining the sort of retail and above all else, um, redefining places to meet. So for me, the really brilliant thing about Coventry at the weekend was they had built some new places to meet. They'd not built them with COVID in mind, but actually they built a city um, that had recovered from the war and bombing, a city that had been silenced by, by all of that. And they rebuilt a city that's for kind of people to meet and for people to take pride in, in where they live and to engage a modern, diverse city. And unbeknownst to them, their COVID recovery plan was kind of delivered really by uh, City of Culture. So that, that's my kind of opening reflections on the first question and we'll go into more detail I think when we talk about some of the, 
the international disconnection, the inability to network nationally, all of those things. Um, but it's uh, it's really interesting to look at two cities that have coped very differently with this. I'm sure we'll come back to these. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's a really great start for us. I'm going to move on to Louisa um, in the context of, of Renfrewshire. You know, would you like to address that first question around about the role of arts and culture in, in recovery? Sure. Thanks, David. And, and, and good morning to everybody. Um, lovely to hear from Andrew and and to hear how um, in particular Coventry have been have been coping, given they were we were one of the contenders against um, <clears throat> Coventry for 2021. So our kind of thoughts have been with them the, the entire journey. Um, I, I think the point um, Andrew has made about the fact that arts and culture have shaped recovery in many guises for all of time, particularly here in Paisley. And um, COVID-19 is, 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 is the next challenge, but it is a profound one um, in terms of the impact that it has had on how communities and how society connects locally, nationally and internationally. So that's a massive repair that's required. When I was kind of reflecting on, on I guess, the role of arts and culture and thinking particularly um, about the sector here in, in Renfrewshire, I guess there's sort of there's sort of three three main areas I, I, I kind of focused on, and, and the first is actually um, that acknowledgement of the significant contribution that arts, culture, and the creative sectors make to our economy in terms of economic growth. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, and social capital. Um, extending that to the tourism sector, but really understanding that contribution in terms of job creation and actually a lot of um, employment opportunities that support young people who have been particularly impacted through learning loss over the past 18 months. And, and really acknowledging that that's a, it's a sector that's, that's fragile, um, that we need to, it's critical in order for arts and culture and practitioners in, in that sector to actually support recovery, that we actually ensure that that sector itself is protected um, through sustainable funding, new business models, about being really innovative about how we reopen venues and enable people to start to come together and connect again. Um, and just how we extend that funding, I guess, beyond, you know, um, cultural organisations and really making sure that there is that sort of pressure locally and nationally to make sure that that support is, is accessible for the sector first and foremost. Um, and, and here in Remshire we've worked really hard um, over the past six months to ensure that there was additional funding made available for, um, for the sector and that came in the form of support for our cultural organisations um, support for individual practitioners to continue to practice, to continue to create, to continue to write, etc. And also um, work with cultural organisations, but also community groups um, to look at how we animated spaces and places um, to bring life back, um, to allow people to visit places and spaces which were previously inaccessible or had just fallen silent. Um, and really starting to examine how like collectively through that funding we could start to breathe life back into our neighbourhoods and to our high streets but actually provide some visual cues that there was a sort of pathway to recovery. So that has been really, really important to us and I, and I think that supporting the sector and then actively engaging the sector to be part of the recovery role, um, to work across sector with public institutions, with the third sector and with the private sector to really drive innovation in terms of how we do um, respond socially, economically, and through our green recovery too. Um, and that way, just that the ability to create that virtuous circle, that mutually beneficial relationship where we protect and support the resilience of the sector and then actively engage that sector and, and, and helping us to, to, to drive forward that, 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 that really sharp recovery planning. Um, that provides real agency and ownership with local communities, which has been a critical part of, of, of the response here in Paisley. Um, the second point is a bit around, I guess, sort of culture for culture's sake. And a lot of the work we've been doing here in Paisley and Remshire is taking our future Paisley programme, which is our cultural re regeneration programme, which came 
which is the legacy of our city of culture bid um, and really starting to shape shift that and that's what arts and culture and our cultural and creative sectors are fantastic for that ability to adapt to pace and shape shift and really looking at that program um, which was due to conclude um, many of the, the, the activities um, at the end of this financial year and next and extending that and you know beyond um, what we'd originally thought the programme would run um, to allow it to <laughs> align with all our cultural infrastructure projects but really to understand that we needed much more time to use Future Paisley and to use cultural regeneration as part of our recovery process and really embedding that practice in our social renewal and economic recovery plans. And we've worked very hard to integrate that. But as well as seeing how, I guess, we can use culture to those benefits. As I said, it's almost about just culture for culture's sake and how we, you know, sort of celebrate um, those moments of joy um, and really start to have a focus on how we create the opportunities for people to coalesce and come together again and I think you know it's you know culture is the oxygen of a place it's it's what makes us unique it's um, what sets us apart from our competitors um, and I think we have all that that sharp focus on when that's removed from us, just how isolating that is for everybody, but particularly groups who are most marginalised in our communities. Um, I think what we really need is those reasons to celebrate and those visual cues that we are actually on the way to a, 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 a new way of living, which is more usual um, or more normal than we've, we've had for the past 18 months. So that, that just the role, you know, in terms of culture for culture's sake is absolutely critical. And thirdly, I think just very quickly, um, a key start point for our social recovery in particular is the ability for communities and groups in society to be able to express what the impact of the pandemic has been for them. And for a lot of groups and for a lot of individuals, that's very difficult. So I think arts and, arts and culture offer really critical tools for people to express themselves um, and to share the narrative and their ideas. And we spent a lot of time over the past 18 months focusing on that here in Paisley. Um, through blogs, through community engagement, through really innovative ways, we were able to extract stories, reconnect with people, connect people to one another again, and really start to understand <clears throat> the stories of those who've been most impacted. Um, to ask the questions about the future, to really unpack those big questions. Um, and, and look beyond to some of the issues, beyond the, the sort of sharpness of the pandemic, you know, climate change, the impact of mental health, particularly in young people. Um, and there's a real opportunity, I think, by working with arts and cultural practitioners to really identify the recovery actions and solutions. And then, I guess, as part of that, I think it's a really important role for how we start to rebuild trust with public institutions and the role of arts and culture in that as well. Um, I think we were already in a place where there was an element of distrust and disconnection from a lot of our public institutions. And that has perhaps been heightened, you know, and that, that gap has become even wider due to the restrictions and a lot of the conflicting information that people have had to juggle with over the past 18 months and a real profound sense of loss and, and feeling let down by a lot of people in our communities. And I think there's a real pivotal role for, for arts and culture there and certainly one that, that, that we're, we, we're tapping into already here in Paisley. Excellent, Louisa. Uh, again, there's some common themes I think already coming through and after we've heard from Gail, I think we'll come back and just a couple of, sort of follow-up questions on those before we move on. So. Uh, Firstly, move on to, to Gail for the, the, the final response to this first area around about recovery and the role <coughs> arts and culture uh, can play. Gail. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's always an advantage in coming third, I think, because you get to listen to the other two exciting uh, contributions. So I'll start with those. I think it, it's really interesting to hear both Andrew and Louisa talk about the way that cities have changed and spaces and places um, and to, talk, to hear from Andrew about, you're absolutely right, that sort of homogenous city centre that we took for granted that had your Woolworths and your W. H. Smiths and your m and and all the rest of it and some of these have gone but increasingly in culture terms we were, we were making bids for city of culture but we were having to show what 
was unique and identified our cultural history and our, our, our sense of place within that city. But if we all looked the same and we all had the same offering, how are we going to do that? We're just going to say we're another big metropolitan city. So I wonder if in many ways the lockdown has given us that opportunity to say, to redefine what our city and our place is and what that how that identity links to the the people of the spaces and the places as well. Um, and from what Louisa was saying there, that's become more important. We're maybe starting to see independent retail stores move back in. We're starting to see cultural hubs open up, uh, spaces being taken over by artists, and we're creating that new identity. Interestingly, it's not, I don't think, for the arts and cultural sector, they've almost been seen as a... Uh, um, the saviour of, of lockdown and that we've engaged in arts and culture and festivity, but they've always been there. They just didn't quite have that voice. The voice wasn't loud enough or it wasn't showcased enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if you look at when we all fill these surveys in at school and they get people to rate what 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 subjects they value the most and we see it's always the English and maths that appear at the top and the arts and social sciences subjects will appear at the bottom or humanities. Yeah, look at a lockdown. What's the thing we valued the most? We're valuing arts and culture and festivity and our sense of being. It gives us our sense of identity. So it's for me, it's not arts and culture are not an add-on to what a city or a place can do. They are what a city and a place are about. They are about our people, our spaces, our places, our identity. And this has given us the chance to showcase that and say, this is who we are. Come and see. And as we come out of lockdown, yes, that will help our economic recovery. And yes, that's been bashed. But this is about our national and our local identities that we can showcase and give more spaces and places back over to city centres and to be able to allow people to do that strolling and wandering and not at that such a fast pace and enjoy the entertainment that may be put on. So that is how I see the two of those connecting. And also we've... Um, We've been fortunate enough, myself and David, leading on a project on social value with other universities, um, Westminster and Dublin, uh, I, I, on the social value of community events for Spirit of London 2012 and Local Trust. And that's been really interesting looking at how they're using arts and culture uh, during lockdown and events and festivals and, and the transformation that that has changed. For them, it was about reducing isolation, it was uh, reducing loneliness, rebuilding around community values and seeing what a common good is. I've talked about this for years, so some of you who know me will know that I've looked at the role of festivals and events as in creating a common good. And now we use language of social value. And how, how do we look at, how do we evaluate social value? And we looked at seven community groups, six of them in England, uh, five in England, one in Wales and one in Scotland. <clears throat> over this period in lockdown and the project's still ongoing at the moment but one of the things that uh, people said is about this is about the value of the people to in, in coming together it's about using arts and culture and festivity in a way that we can showcase and and work with and in partnership with others that we maybe didn't get a chance to before so again for local authorities for private sector this is about re-engaging in a, a social value approach that says intuitively we know we're doing the right thing and intuitively we know we're making a difference as louisa said to people's mental health to their sense of belonging to their sense of well-being but how are we evaluating it and one of the things that we're working on just now with um uh our key partners is coming up with an evaluation framework and a set of guidelines and tools to, to show that, which would um, happily share with others when it's finished. So, but I think these um, are especially important and we're hearing things like wellbeing being mentioned as a key thing that will come out of lockdown. How do we look after each other's wellbeing? And of course, this fits into Scottish Government's strategy leading the way of well-being is at the, the core of what we do and if, if we sort the well-being and our health and social well-being along with that then the economic recovery will follow so you know we tried the economic recovery recovery first and hoped well-being will follow and that didn't really work it tied into our neoliberal ideas that the marketplace would win but that's not worked for this seems much more that people were 
keen to get back and spend in our city centres to go to live events, to hear live music, to to use art and culture in ways that perhaps we didn't quite engage so fully before. And that these were changing the way that we use civic spaces to make that happen. Um, so anyway, I think that's probably enough for me on the first question. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. So, so three, three really interesting responses with a lot of commonality. I just want to come back on, you know, a common theme was the way in which maybe the arts and culture maybe is being increasingly valued, and in particular during lockdown. And I just wanted to ask maybe, you know, any of you can come in here about whether we think that local authorities and arts agencies will actually see investment in arts and culture as being a response to the pandemic, or, you know, we know we're going to be in very tightened fiscal times. So, you know, to what extent are any of you feeling or seeing a kind of you know an inclination to invest because of the value that you've all talked about or again are we fighting against quite a difficult you know set of priorities that governments and local authorities have well i suppose i could come in david <clears throat> first from the point of view of a um Renfrewshire council and you know our commitment with our partner Renfrewshire leisure um to support the, the the cultural sector um, in Renfrewshire and to continue to um, deliver our future Paisley ambitions. So certainly um, the whole ethos of our economic and, and, and social recovery plans has been underpinned with like arts and creativity. It's, it, it, that, that's actually been at the core um, of how those strategies have been developed. And our future Paisley funding has been um, you know, enhanced to allow us to provide emergency funding to the sector. And certainly we've been given the guarantees that that funding um, that we have and that extension to the programme um, for another two years um, that has been committed to. Now, it's hard to see what that, 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 that you know, whether that will see this, that being mirrored and, and certainly in other parts of the country, but here um, in Renfrewshire, and that is a, a cornerstone um, of how we see um, both our social and economic recovery um, in terms of arts and creativity being a, a core part of that. And as you'll know through our work with the CCSE, we've really started to sharpen you know, our ability, not just through investment, and I think it's, all, it's important to point that out, not just through the, the actual financial investment, but also in terms of influence and how we influence future policy, how we influence future strategy by being cultural envoys at all time and ensuring that sort of arts-based practice is included in all our, our sort of future policy decision-making and strategy. So that's sort of two two-pronged approach. But certainly from our perspective, um, that investment in, in, arts, and in arts and culture is, is sacrosanct to, to our, our, our plans to recover and renew. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, do you have anything maybe to, to no, read into I, that? I mean, I haven't got a, an encyclopedic knowledge of the local authorities of the UK, but um, certainly the ones that I've been working with um, through the last year and, and, and most recently, um, I, I've seen a, a kind of greater understanding of the role of arts and culture and actually an increase in investment from local authorities combined authorities the national government i mean you know the uk government's response to and the scottish government's response to um the cultural sector in covid recovery has been a massive i mean if only we had that level of funding on a normal basis um uh, so I, I think there's been a realization that the arts is, is a kind of important way of, of reaching out. I was going to answer it in the next question, but um, I, I've been working with Bradford in West Yorkshire. It's the sixth largest city in the UK. It's 50% non-white on, on, on um, English uh, background. Um, and it's a city that's particularly difficult to kind of reach out to in community engagement. But the local authority used the arts and used um, the arts to reach into communities and to reach into education and did a kind of call out for artists to come and do alternative learning online. And um, I think the status of the arts in that part of the UK has really gone up because of, of how um, the artists and culture responded. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's done, uh, it's obviously done huge harm to the arts and the cultural sector. Um, but it's done a lot to recognise just just the, the variety of things that cultural organisations can do and the importance of them as 
as venues. I mean, Eden Court in Inverness, they won one of the Gulbenkian Awards for civic contribution. They were the hub for food banks, for distribute, for community engagement through the pandemic. And that, that was happening across the UK. Yeah. yeah. Gil, do you have anything before we move on to the next question? Uh, no, I think that's fine. Okay, so you know, again, linked to what we we were talking about, this this sort of second area question was was maybe meant to be a little bit provocative in terms of what contribution can arts and culture play in repairing systems and processes that that may have been damaged by COVID nineteen. So, Andrew, would you maybe like to sort of take us away again on the second question? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, people will have different definitions of systems and processes, but um, I, I've kind of taken a broad definition of of um the process of life and how it's how it's changed um i i went on a train uh last weekend for the first time for 12 months i was used to traveling 19 hours a week on trains and i realized that this kind of process this natural process of movement around our countries and let alone international movement had been seriously disrupted what was the reason that made me move again? Culture, it was to go to Coventry. Now, that won't be everybody, and not everybody on that train was uh, being sent to Coventry to see City of Culture. Um, but it is one of the things, I think the whole uh, pe people's caution about going to cultural events, going to large sporting events, about moving out of their local authority area when Nicola Sturgeon's banned me to go beyond the boundaries of, of Edinburgh for, for seven months. Um, has taken a real knock and it's going to take something to to change people because I think people have become cautious um, the international dimension really worries me not because I can't go to Portugal without quarantining or, 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 or that but the at a time when we've had Brexit and when the kind of international partnerships and culture and our, and our engagement as the UK with Europe and the world was going to be having a difficult time anyway it's taken an even bigger knock and the ability to uh, reach out to the world um, uh, for local authorities town twinning you remember that um, who's going to be doing town twinning and and that sort of reciprocal arrangements with other parts of the world it's quite interesting I mean Coventry's opening event of the weekend was live streamed I don't particularly like live streamed events, um, much prefer live, but it did reach 80 countries. And uh, I, I can't imagine in the past uh, kind of an opening of City of Culture doing that. Um, so perhaps there are kind of new things that culture is enabling us to do and to uh, invent uh, from a streaming point of view. Um, another thing, this, this may seem a bit left field, but that's me. Um, I, I think the news is a process that has been disrupted by covid um the news has been totally dominated by covid by virus by statistics about deaths and hospitalization and everything else for 18 months and we're not learning enough about uh, normal life and about the rest of the world and the real issues that are kind of ongoing and you know even climate change the climate crisis has taken a back seat to uh, COVID, and I, I think culture could play a really important part in reconnecting the population with the news. Um, education, obviously, is a process that's been massively disrupted. I mentioned the Bradford example, uh, but I think many people have been trying to find creative ways to deliver education online through culture, ironically, as, as governments try and strip it out of the curriculum. Um, but I, I think culture has a, a really important part to play in in fixing that process. Um, trust. Uh, I think it was Louise that mentioned trust. Uh, we've lost our trust. You know, you you sit in a train carriage, and do you trust the person opposite you not to have COVID? Do you do you trust people to be socially distant? Um, uh, how is culture going to kind of tackle that when um, theatres come back together? How can we uh, reconnect people to uh, be able to meet and 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 be in close proximity? I think you know culture can 
play a, a role in that. So those are some of the things that, that I felt. Um, during uh, the, the, the right, working, I, I go a bit of a uh, hobby horse about this. I, I, you know, one of the most significant things that co the, the, the COVID pandemic has affected is, is people's attitude to work. And uh, I spent a lot of time on Portobello Beach uh, last year, and it was like furlough on sea. Uh, people happily uh, spending the time on, on the beach um, with the families. Um, and that's great. Uh, the kind of family experience is good. But that ability to coalesce with other people at work um, has been lost. And I think uh, that the home working uh, may well be a big thing in the future. Um, but culture has to find a way of um, bringing people back into the workplace. Uh, both in the in the art sector um, and in in other sectors too, um, uh, volunteering um, is a process that's actually benefited from um, from COVID. Um, and actually, the arts and culture has been quite good on engaging with volunteering. I certainly, Hull had you know over two thousand uh, five hundred volunteers for their city of culture and commentary. You know, I arrived at the station, fantastic welcome from young people in blue jackets. Um, actually, the arts can teach people, I think, long term about how volunteering can play a part in society. Um, but I do think it's an area that's really benefited from COVID because people have had more time. They have kind of recognised a need to engage uh, with their cities and their place. Um, I live in the centre of Edinburgh. We have some communal gardens, and uh, 35 people came out to volunteer for um, a, a gardening weekend. We had to separate them into different gardens, socially distance them, and all of that. But um, uh, I think there's a, um, a new mood around volunteering, which arts and culture could really play a part in maintaining and building. And then I, I'll probably let others talk about mental health, but. Um, you know, isolation and mental health has been one of the biggest um, legacies of city culture. Some that's very close uh, to me. Uh, both my my partner and my daughter work in this field, um, and uh, I, I think arts and culture um, could play a much bigger role in the future when it's allowed to um, in addressing issues of mental health. In Bradford, again, it's a really brilliant research project called Born in Bradford that's tracking the lives of 30,000 people. This was happening way before COVID, but literally 30,000 people, um, new families and uh, new children being born and families are being tracked and, and linked to that. We're now tracking um, not just their mental health, but their engagement with arts and culture and its impact on mental health. And I think that research and evaluation, uh, looking at how arts and culture, music, other things affect uh, people's mental health uh, is a really important. I think it, it's going to come into its own. So there's a few observations. No, really good. I mean, I think for those that are going to be able to stay with us this afternoon, we're going to have a specific panel looking at well-being and mental health around about arts and culture and, and the pandemic. So that would be really good if people could follow and stay on for that. Okay, Lu uh, Louisa, um, from the perspective of, a, again, maybe from a local authority perspective, you, know, what, you see the contribution arts and culture can play in and repairing systems or rebuilding systems that may have been damaged by the, the the COVID pandemic in the broader sense? Well, I guess actually one of the points I was going to raise, you'd maybe expect because of my role in, in, in communications and um, Andrew's covered this, but it was around, you know, the sort of consumption of, of, of media um, and and just the massive role that I think arts and culture have in actually disrupting that sort of steady stream of, you know, COVID information and news. And we have certainly found that really difficult, increasingly difficult as, as, as the past 18 months have gone on um, to actually cut through some of that really important public health messaging that has to be out there. So our channels have been really focused on making sure we get public health information to people as quickly as possible and at the right time. And it's really forced us to then think about how we also 
you know, give people some respite from that messaging as well. And that has been really, really hard from a communications perspective um, to make that gel and to make that work. But when we look at what local people have engaged with, have interacted with, have shared, have contributed to, it has all been content um, mm -hmm. that relates to arts and, and culture and, and, and events. Um, that's what provokes discussion. That's what seems to give people, a, a, you know, a, a, some form of like creative outlet to have a discussion that isn't monopolised about by the, the the public health crisis. So that you know, and and itself is really important. Um, the other thing that I guess just on that as well is as as actually, you know that routes to local people in terms of our communication channels where we have seen um you know a, a lot of people understandably start to step back from you know traditional news channels and, and our main um communication sort of platforms um where we saw the initial spike of you know increased um, numbers of people you know following um our information and tuning in that has started to steady off and we found it's been really really important um, particularly in terms of reaching marginalised groups and local neighbourhoods, to start to use the, you know, that network of, of, of sort of trusted groups and sources within the community, and overwhelmingly, um, that tends to be um, local cultural organisations and groups and artists, etc., who have that real connection and trusted connection with local communities. So there's a really important role um, for our. Um, arts and, and culture and actually communication and the sharing of, of information um, with, with local groups. So that, that, that was kind of one point. There's another bit as well around, I think, how arts and culture can bring new perspectives to just how we sort of plan and deliver services. And I, I think this probably touches on some of the comments Andrew made as well, but you might remember as part of the Scottish government's initial economic um, recovery strategy. There was the, the, this the, the mention of a sort of national arts force, um, which which I thought was a really good idea. But I actually think there there's something in that, um, not just for the sort of creative um, industry, but actually for arts and cultural practitioners and how we can you know, invite them to work in other sectors, you know, from a local authority perspective, in our schools, um, in our care homes, in healthcare facilities, in our workplaces, um, to really start to make that connection between cultural activity and, 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 and the catalyst for, you know, sort of recovery and reimagining what those, I guess, even to begin with, those physical spaces, how they work, but also how we then start to interact and connect with one another in an advent of blended learning, hybrid working, etc. when actually our working conditions and our ability to come together and collaborate is significantly restricted. And that collaboration point I found very, very difficult from a sort of communications and marketing perspective. When you think about delivering events, festivals, all those creative processes which actually feed of people being able to come together and collaborate, that has been greatly inhibited. And I think there's a real way we could bring new perspectives to how we plan around that and reimagine our workplaces and schools, etc., care facilities of the future. So I think that's really important. The other part is that we just need to bring back events and festivals in some capacity. Um, you know, the cancellation of events, of religious festivals, of weddings, of restrictions on funerals, of things that are actually like critical and fundamental to our, our human rights, I feel. Um, these are all things that erode community resilience and you need community resilience to be able to recover at a pace. So I, I think that, you know, being able to reintroduce arts and festivals in whatever capacity is absolutely critical for that social region, from that sense of unity and togetherness, but examining our commonality and our values again and using those values as part of, of, of developing, you know, our, our, our recovery aims. Um, there's a whole thing around reimagining our, our public spaces, but I think we'll get to that in the next question. And then the other bit I was going to just touch up on because of, of I guess, my local authority role is, is, is around learning loss. And, you know, just thinking particularly at school age of how we embed arts and culture 
to to fuel that sort of catch up, but also to identify what now for young people, you know, um, and using cultural content to actually understand that. Um, there's the wider issue of skills development, um, of personal development, how we turbo boost confidence and develop a future workforce, digital skills, the sort of creative entrepreneurs of the future. But given the challenges that young people have had to deal with over the past 18 months, there's a massive opportunity to really turbocharge their recovery, personal and learning journey through arts and culture that I really think, you know, we need to explore. And the same can be said for, you know, like health and social care and the very important points Andrew made about, you know, preventing loneliness, enhancing wellbeing and, you know, supporting people to adopt healthier habits. Um, I think there's a lot around older people and reconnecting older people again um, who have been significantly impacted by the pandemic and also how we support um, you know, carers and provide some respite for carers. So there's a number of groups who have been significantly marginalised and impacted and those gaps in equality have widened and there's a real role um, for our arts and, and, and cultural sector to, to help to mend that and, and, and to deliver targeted programmes that allow us to do that. And that's certainly what we've been focusing on here in Paisley. You know, first and foremost, making sure our cultural investment remains on the table. The Work for Future Paisley, £100 million investment in our cultural venues and ensuring that they're COVID proof um, and that we use all our learning now to really help continue to design what those venues and spaces will look like. And then underpinning that, very targeted programmes to allow us to re-engage with groups that we've just not been able to reach and or who haven't been able to reach out and, and connect with us. Now, fascinating, Louise. I mean, I think it really looks like the kind of the importance of that kind of embedding culture and a range of activities, not not being separate and additional to, but but part of the way of forming solutions to some of the big problems that we're we're going to face seems to be very much coming through clearly there and what you're doing in Renfrewshire. Um, just going to hand over to Gail for the for the kind of final response to this second question, Gail, on on repair. Yeah, thanks, David. <clears throat> um, I sort of looked at this from a slightly different angle because I looked at the question and thought, well, what contribution can arts and culture play in repairing systems and processes broken by COVID? And I thought, you know, it's interesting. I actually think the what, what we've witnessed during this period is more arts and culture repairing systems and processes that were actually already broken before COVID. And COVID have highlighted that they were broken and so that we needed to fix them. And so some of the work that our artists and those in um, culture sphere have been able to say, we have been doing this, but we've not had the platform, so we can show you what we're doing. And in a way, this has been an opportunity slightly differently to, for arts and culture to draw attention to the wider deficit issues that exist in society and to help readdress those. So things like the fractures and isolation issues that many individuals and communities have experienced through other structural inequalities, such as poverty, unemployment, physical exclusion through disability from the arts, etc., have been made worse and exacerbated by COVID. And then the arts and cultural agents, if you like, and communities have said, well, hang on a minute, we want, we want to challenge this. We want to use this to show you why society is unequal and inaccessible, etc., and we can do something about that. So I thought that was really interesting response from the arts world in, in this area. Um, an engagement with the arts and the cultural processes, not just the final product, but the process of engagement um, has helped for many people in that way. It's helped reduce the isolation, the loneliness, etc. Now, you know, I'm not for a minute saying that arts and culture is going to solve all of society's ills, um, and nor should it. But it can take the lead in restoring some of the values and sense of belonging that uh, was once at the heart of communities and places and visible in our cultural forms and, and practices within those communities. And that's been reimagined, re-engaged. Um, and we're seeing that the resurgence of local galladies, resurgence of, of, of little bits of land that the vast local authorities, can we have this back? You know, things that were taking away everything from, well, we used to have our fireworks up in that hill, but we can't anymore because it's, it's now a car park or it's something else. So communities have started to looking at 
uh, repopulating spaces that are, are no longer used to be part of what they can do. And I think that whole area of this, the structural inequalities has come forward and that you're saying initially for people with disabilities that couldn't go to venues or couldn't go to art, art, arts venues or sporting venues for that matter to be physically active during COVID and were courage to self-isolate or stay home. This, this made worse for, for everybody. But what changed was we were all stripped bare of that sense of belonging and all forced into some form of isolation, whether that was to a greater or lesser extent. But these have allowed those people, they, they, this, um, this experience to all of us has made us all realise that this is not okay. And what has happened now is it's allowed the people with the talent for engagement, for empowerment, for leadership, to work alongside those with the creative talent to reimagine and re-engage communities. And I think that's been really interesting and that, that has been a real shift in what we've seen. So to give you an example, some of the stuff that we've been doing with Local Trust, um, they've been funding community groups through art and culture, but also in events and festivals and sport to help broaden participation in gender, community spirit and pride. Sometimes it was lost um, or disparate groups that were maybe brought together and they had no sense, they might have been brought together geographically, but no cultural identity together to, to work together on new projects. And they received funding sometimes to, to actually on a cultural infrastructure project, such as a play park. And people thought, well, you know, it's a play park. How's that going to do it? But suddenly that land, the play park over a period of a year became more of a space for community events, for religious events, for participation, for walking and strolling, for getting to know the people in the community. How many times, David, have we heard time and time again? I now know people in my neighbourhood. I speak to my neighbour down the road. I actually meet, we've, we've held street not parties, street events, socially distanced. So this has given us the people with that talent, that chance to say we can do something about isolation in our communities. And actually, but my point is it existed before COVID. COVID didn't create the isolation. We were structurally, socially adrift. And this has been a way of actually, in some ways, bringing us back together. Um, we've demonstrable evidence that there's reduced isolation there's increased well-being and thus some sense of individual and wider societal objectives in, uh, within communities being met. Arts and cultural projects, whether funded centrally or run by volunteers, as Louisa was saying, over lockdown has demonstrated that there's a desire and a need to fulfil a sense of community well-being face to face. Um, and to have that interaction, even if that's on a small scale and small levels, but as some of our um, comments on the chat have suggested, the hybrid way of doing things is probably here to stay. So how do we maximise that to the benefit and reach out for those that were digitally, digitally excluded before and actually bring them together? As others have talked about here, we've seen more street events and everything from cultural routes through nature, uh, lighting of walks of historical buildings and towns, music on street corner, bingo, socially distanced and communities. Um, but what these have done is that they have, they've made our, they've let people look out, they've let people look up um, and they've let people look through other people's eyes of what and who their community is to them and others. So born out of a negative, arts and culture has provided a positive way of engaging with others in the community that you may have known or you may not have known and ensure that we can, and if we can ensure that we continue to do this and not see it as a temporary solution to buy time as passes. Thank you very much, Gail. Uh, again, this sort of commonality of themes and, and I think I'm going to come back maybe just afterwards on the kind of especially that kind of informal and everyday cultural experiences that people have that seem to me quite different from maybe some of the official um, and professional arts world that people um, experience, which has been very, very heavily damaged and affected by pandemic. And I think Andrew's put a little comment uh, in that as well in one of the questions. So I'm just aware of time and I'm just going to maybe just go to the third question and then that'll allow us to pass through the third question and then open it up for a kind of wider 
discussion on a number of really interesting issues that have arisen. So the, the final question was really about what will our places look like post-pandemic and, and what role can arts and culture play in, in that process? So if I, we go to you first, Andrew, just for the, the final response. Okay, well, I mean, obviously, you know, we've seen <coughs> changes to our, our towns and villages and and cities uh, pre-pandemic. I was, um, I think it was nine years ago, um, on the um, commission that was looking at the future of Scotland's town centres and looking at the role culture might play in, in, in them. And we, we've seen that decline, not just because of um, the internet and online shopping, um, but um, other reasons to do with transport out of town retail parks and other things that are happening. So there's been lots of things other than COVID that have have affected um, urban uh, degeneration. Um, I think the most interesting thing that, that will happen uh, post COVID is that people will start living again in the center of towns and cities. If uh, I, I was speaking at a big conference in uh, Melbourne, Australia a few years ago, and really taken by, you know, that city, Melbourne is the most livable city in the world. Um, but it had hundreds of empty, derelict uh, upper floors um, and needed to do something about it. And uh, so there's a really great initiative which had a kind of an arts element to it to make Melbourne a, no a more livable space. They, um, they gave uh, people um, carts to sell things on, whether it's crafts or flowers or coffee. Uh, to make the, the place come alive. Uh, they created an animated events. They let people spray paint and graffiti and, and create interesting back streets. And, and Melbourne, you know, kind of turned itself around and I think something like 29,000 people then came and lived in you those know, um, upper floors. Um, again, the actual States, surprisingly, is ahead of the game in this, Providence in the United States in an earlier economic crisis um, started creating incentives for artists to live in town centres. They gave them tax breaks, actually. Um, uh, but uh, essentially, you know, we'll give them kind of live workspaces in town centres. But I think in general, um, and, and I could see this, I could see it in front of my eyes in Coventry at the weekend, um, town centres are going to become more livable. Um, they're going to be less uh, about retail, less about um, nightlife and more about meeting places and I think um, culture can play a really significant role in, in um, helping with that, the environment around them again some of the, the streetscape work in Coventry is exemplary um, but also in animating space or, or creating um, moments of, of uh, silence and beauty that the people will want to engage with their, their town centres um, I think if you look at retail, uh, the, the really successful uh, independent uh, retailers in town centres have often got that kind of cultural edge. Um, I was taken a few years back when I was working in Leicester um, as to why it had such a strong independent retail sector. It had big things, you know, like House of Fraser and uh, other stores, but it had this kind of really edgy independent sector. And if you look at the West End of Glasgow, uh, I know there's been a lot of closures recently, but um, with that kind of mix of galleries um, like street level and artist spaces with independent shopping, I think that's what the kind of future is going to look like. And the kind of growth of independent bookshops and um, uh, kind of street food. Um, and, and this brings me on to that issue really about about definition of culture and has has the definition of culture changed um i, I think it has i i don't think it'd be long before um arts councils and creative scotland's and cultural agencies um have food development officers and have are investing in um sustainable living through culture um uh, there's an absolutely brilliant project uh, that has got money from uh, Festival 2022, uh, led by the visionary Angus Farquhar, um, Neil Butler in Glasgow, uh, Celtic Connections, Face Ross, whole group of what I call a kind of mavericks. 
and they've uh, they got funding to do the most inspirational project. It's called Dandelion. I'm not sure about the title, uh, but look it up. Um, this is going to be big in Scotland and the UK, and it's all about um, sustainable growing, sustainable food, sustainable festivals, creating community-based engagement through uh, the place where where food meets culture and um, I, I think that will be one of the most significant things I'm on the board of Deveron Projects one of my favorite cultural organizations in the world uh, up in Huntley in Aberdeenshire and Deveron's always had uh, a kind of an element of food to its work um, remember the town is the menu developed by the artist Simon Preston, where the, the town invented its own menu. But during lockdown, uh, what did Devon Arts do? Um, it created a bakery, it created a, an honesty stall, it created a kind of market, a place that people could come to. And it's now kind of coming out of lockdown with um, further kind of cultural festivals that, that um, form that around, around food. Um, and food, of course, is one of the things that kind of connects us internationally uh, in a very simple, simple way. And, and I do think um, that's going to be one of the ways that we, we get renewal with um, our understanding of the world. Um, so th those are a few reflections. Um, what will high streets look like? Um, well, you know, they're not, they're not going to be kind of festivals every weekend. Um, but I do think there will be more of a sense of festival. Um, you, you look at the Edinburgh Fringe and those kind of places like Underbelly and um, Assembly where uh, people can come together on a bit of artificial grass with a tent and a Spiegel, Spiegel tent. Um, it's a clever model, but that's what our, that's what our uh, town centres need to look like in the future. They need to be places that are kind of attracting people but a, a places that uh, people want to live again. Um, yeah, I, I'm really fortunate. I live right in the centre of Edinburgh, just off Princes Street. And um, and I walk down Princes Street and I worry about it because uh, there's more voids and more empty big shops on Princes Street than there are in Coventry. Um, uh, there's a big new shopping centre being built with, you know, doubtless posh handbags and um, Harvey Nichols type stuff in. Um, and that's kind of pulling away from a really important um, high street. So even places like Prince Street are going to have to reinvent themselves. George Street adjacent to it's being pedestrianised. I think they've pedestrianised the wrong street. I think actually Prince Street is the one that should have been pedestrianised. Um, we've got to be radical. We've got to think different ways that kind of culture and travel will work together um uh, maybe the out of the you know the out of town shopping centers will will change as well uh, really interesting the edinburgh international festival is working with uh, one of my clients partner parabola on edinburgh park and they're creating a venue right out of the city um uh, on a, a some brownfield site that's being developed for housing and offices and we might experience culture in different places, temporary places, not necessarily big theatres in the future. Um, I think lots of challenges for those building-based um, projects in, in our cities, concert halls and, and theatres, and um, I, I hope we can find solutions for them, but I think the streets become really important for culture and street art will be the thing of the future. Fascinating, fascinating, Andrew. So lots of issues there that I think will, will be, relate to what people have also been asking in the chat. So we'll come to those after that we've heard the last couple of, of, of contributions. Um, okay, Louisa, your, your, maybe your response to the last question round about, about renewal and what that might look sure. for. <clears throat> sure. You know, can I reflect on this over the past week? And I, I don't mean this to sound like, you know, a, a, a cop out, but, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't think we're 100% you know, know what our places um, will will look like. I think there's a definite role for arts and arts and culture, regardless. Um, um, clearly, but I do think we've still got a journey ahead in terms of managing the virus, understanding people's level of caution um, as we continue to emerge from restrictions. Um, we need much more clarity on 
national restrictions around social distancing, etc. Um, before we really know what our places will look like, but how people will start to reuse places and what the relationship with places will be. And I'm talking about that difference between your local neighbourhood and a sort of an, an, an urban centres, I guess. Um, ultimately, I think arts and, and culture have a significant role to play post-pandemic and urban design and adapting spaces to those socially distanced rules. Um, but, but I think it, there's maybe a bit of a, a sort of deeper question around this. And, and I guess what I've been sort of considering over, over, over the past week or so is that sort of balance between the localism agenda and, you know, that, that, that the concept of a, a 20 minute, you know, neighbourhood, um, which is continues to be strengthened by, by home working. Um, and that could be the position for, for much, much longer, I think, for, for, for a lot of us. Um, and, they, and, 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 and then what's the future role of sort of town centres and, and, and city centres and sort of high density or, or urban areas? Um, you know, will people still want, you know, to, to live and work in, in, in urban areas and cities post-pandemic? Well, what will people have you know we know people have really started to connect to their homes and their neighborhoods in a much deeper way you know discovering their, their gardens and places of interest and and starting to you know make personal connections with neighbors and their local retailers etc and um you know sort of neighborhood sort of shops and amenities and I, I, i'm wondering you know that appreciating as well the benefits of sort of quieter roads and not having travel time for a lot of people as well. I just, I, I just wonder, you know, how significant the shift is in people's values, and that the development of our, our future place will, will really need to consider that. Um, that said, um, I think that balance is really required in terms of how we then start to think about, you know, not leaving hollowed out, you know, town centres and city centres. I think from this sort of local perspective, we've. And I think it's been mentioned in the chat about that, that, that those sorts of connections to your neighbours and, and, and to people that you know that, that you, you live close to and that you work with. And I think we've just kind of recognised through lockdown just how essential community life is to like health and wellbeing generally. Um, I think we're much more aware of of the need for social connections for neighbours of that sense of belonging. Um, and I think, you know, nationwide, we all really appreciated the strength of that community response, particularly in the early days, and what can really be achieved through, you know, grassroots activism and empowerment and volunteering that, that Andrew touched on. And I think it's really important that, that, you know, we hold on to that. We need local people to design and drive the development of their communities to continue to do that. And I, I do believe that can only be properly facilitated through arts and culture to, to, to really co-design and realise what local people want from the places that they, they live and work. And again, I think, you know, that sort of, that, that it builds emotional connection, it builds resilience, it's really important for the fabric of our neighbourhoods and it's really important for addressing inequalities because it allows communities to come together to really understand and have a deeper sense of understanding for the inequalities that are there. It allows things to be more visible, it allows us to find the solutions quicker. So, so, so not losing that sort of sense of that sort of local um, integration I think is going to be really important. At the at the same time, we need to make sure towns and city centres are, are livable spaces for like just like normal, regular people um, who aren't priced out of, of those locations. Um, they need to nurture and serve local communities. They need to serve our business communities. We need to be able to walk in them, cycle in them, um, share communal spaces in them. So there's a whole sort of new dimension to, I guess, sort of town centre planning that's required and that is absolutely something that we have we have capitalised on here in Paisley in terms of the work that's taking place in, in our town centre um, around cultural infrastructure development and the rethinking of our public realm and those spaces, cycle lanes, green routes, um, pathways, how we spread that out, improving play areas and community gardens etc but really having that sharp focus now on, 
on, on the values our local communities have and in, in designing our town centres with those things in mind to be places that people can really enjoy living and working in. Um, and I, I do think that you have to, to get that right. You really need to understand the, the, the diversity of everybody who, who, who uses those space and to really consider accessibility issues that, that, that Gail's mentioned, um, you know, in terms of financial accessibility, but physical accessibility and making sure that all those gaps and those, you know, that inequality that existed before are now properly and fundamentally addressed. And I do, I, I, I feel that the only way to really tap into that, to understand the values and what makes the fundamental difference that needs to be done using, you know, arts and culture to really help people articulate what those needs are and to bring an entirely different perspective to, to urban design. Fantastic, fantastic, Louisa. They, you know, again, these relate. There's some questions, really good questions we've got coming in in the chat that I think relate to some of these things around about inequalities. You know, I think you said right at the beginning the difficulty of understanding quite what it's going to look like actually because we're still in pandemic guess, in mode in many respects so uh, again just aware we, we want to leave 20 30 minutes for questions so um gail do you want to give us the last response to, to this question before we move on to to the questions from the floor um thank you david i don't think i probably got too much to add on this last part because i think andrew and louisa have covered a lot of that and what I was perhaps going to say. I think I was thinking a little bit about the spaces um, and places in terms of how will they how will they seem emotionally, not just physically. And if we really thought about that journey around the spaces, and obviously we've we've had to create a, um, a reaction to the places and spaces as we move out of lockdown. Much harder, of course, in Scotland when we have weather like today that has now just started to pour rain. Um, and so that is perhaps easier in other parts of the world um, and other parts of the UK where you can be outdoors for arts and cultural entertainment and for performances and theatre shows that we are now seeing. And I think some dimensions and comments that are, you know, touring in a different way where putting on things outdoors. But what happens when you don't have the weather for that? So is that a case of building more, um, some of these sort of temporary wooden structures that you see elsewhere, a lot of times in the States, uh, you see that and uh, elsewhere in Europe, that they're used as outdoor picnic areas. They're just open, almost like a, a, a tent, but they're a wooden structure and they're open for community groups of different size to be able to use in places and spaces. So it could be used for performance and art and outdoor spaces, but also can be used um, for people to just gather and, and and picnic and, and, and belong. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of that in Glasgow and Edinburgh. I was in both places this week, looking at the likes of the Royal Mile, where they have put temporary, or it may be permanent, but uh, wooden uh, seating areas for restaurants, hospitality structures. We're seeing that in the way that George Square has been reimagined in Glasgow, um, where two of the sides of the George Square have been pedestrianised or given over to hospitality businesses. Now, you could, some people might argue this is what they wanted to do anyway, but hadn't had the chance to be able to do it or hadn't had the engagement and public voice to do that. But as we saw th through the period, the public voice was stronger and that they needed more social spaces, then we perhaps started to see some of that. Would these have been the same changes we would have made if we had a, a, a year or two to plan them properly, though? Are we making, as maybe Louise is saying, some of those knee-jerk reactions into quickly giving over spaces that we might not really have planned if we had maybe let some of the artists uh, um, in with the urban planners to, to, to do that a bit more? Uh, the cycleways, for sure, the people were asking, can we, you know, we've been asking for years, can we have these, but can we have them demarcated from the actual traffic? Well, that can't all just happen in a nanosecond. It takes a bit longer in terms of some of that. But who who is it that we need to empower to do this, to create um, these the structural changes that we might want to make in cities 
to to plan. Andrew talked about that he thought that people would uh, more people would move to to cities and want to see, and I thought that was really interesting because that's a, a bit different from some of the voices that we've heard on that. We're saying people were moving to the countryside to be away, to have more space, to so that there, that sense of trust, as Andrew talked about as well, where you're you thinking, oh, I don't really want to be with all these people, so being careful. However, if we reimagine those places and spaces where we give more time to watching, to strolling, to could it suggest that we might see a change of uh, pace in our lifestyle, that we might just slow down a bit and think we don't need to be on this absolute treadmill and running at a million miles an hour. You know, many futurologists or whatever talked in the, the, the 80s about a four day week and you know, will we see more of that? Will people reevaluate their own life and say, do you know what, I want to get off that treadmill a bit. I don't want to work at that pace. It's not just about hybrid working. And yes, we'd like to maintain that. And workplaces, as Louisa said, need us to maintain it. We can't work desk to desk anymore. So we need to think differently about spaces. Um, but hopefully we might think differently about the places and the emotion emotional energy that that takes from us as well to engage in that in the way that we used to engage and that it may be um less frantic in these reappropriated spaces i don't know though i think the weather's still going to put us off <laughs> that's, that's the benefit of the of the um uh, virtual meeting is that no one has to you know we, uh, we, the weather doesn't affect us all quite as badly that's that, I mean, that's been it's been fascinating to hear all of your responses to these questions and the way you've interpreted them, and and that's really created a really interesting discussion. We now want to to open up to respond to sort of questions that are coming in, and they're really interesting questions and, and comments. So, um, I'm just going to try and sort of summarise some of these, and then and then see if we can get your responses. So, there's been a, a bit of comment round about sort of community, and I think Louisa, you talked about localism, you talked about the engagement with the. With local groups and communities and how we sustain that so one comment i do like the positive mind of engaging more closely with the community in terms of getting the chance to know people from the same area etc do you think this will continue after the pandemic and relatedly um another point about i'm fascinated by the debate around community needs and wants lots of projects claim to be co-created but i wonder what the reality is in terms of impact value segmentation so Perhaps we could respond to that idea of the sort of community and the relationship between arts, culture, and community and local neighbourhood kind of context, and and actually whether that will continue and how it will continue uh, as the pandemic maybe wanes. Who would like to who would like to take us away on that one? Uh, Andrew, my, sorry. Go Andrew first, and then Louisa. Okay, uh, I'll go. Um, uh, one of the great ideas we had when we were putting together the Coventry bid, sorry about this, Louisa. Um, uh, Coventry is, you know, is a kind of city of, of multiple communities, and um, uh, the the history doesn't uh, the history of the place is very deep. But because twenty seven percent of the population was born outside the UK, um, twenty seven percent of the population doesn't know the heritage of Coventry and the rest of Coventry doesn't know the heritage of those 27% of people. So we had two brilliant projects. Uh, what, one was the diversity of heritage, the heritage of diversity, which helped people get to know their city and their people better. Um, and the other one was uh, 21 streets of culture, where we would find kind of 21 streets or 21 communities um, who loved something about their place. and. Um, and coming up with those kind of constructs for engaging with communities has been really valuable for Coventry through COVID because it, it has, it, a lot of it's happened online and digital, but it has enabled conversations to take place at a, at a really local level. And, um, you know, arts organisations have been doing outreach and, and education and community engagement for years. Uh, but I think the kind of co-creation, when it's done really well, uh, will surprise people in terms of just, you know, how radical and different the ideas might be. Um, and uh, I think we, that's, again, where I think the definitions of culture are going to uh, change over, over, over time and uh, embrace people's own responses to where they live and, and their own responses to culture. Um, 
So yeah, I, th I think community engagement's really here, and 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 it's got to be, frankly. You know, when you look at the audience and participation figures um, in Scotland and and across the UK, um, it's unacceptable that you know. 60 70 percent of the population isn't engaging yes you see statistics saying 80 percent or 90 percent they're engaging with culture well they're going to the cinema but it's unacceptable that um very large percentages are, are not engaging on the regular with the subsidized culture and we've, we've got to find ways of tackling that louisa um i totally agree um totally agree with Andrew. I guess um, the one thing I'd say coming from the, the perspective of, of, of Renfrewshire and certainly Paisley is, you know, Paisley's history has always been marked by radicalism and activism and that certainly shows no signs of waning. And <clears throat> I do think that the our bid for UK City of Culture, um, the only town to ever be shortlisted um, so far, um, really really sort of turbocharged that sort of co-design process and that really that that just hasn't stopped since um you know the the future paisley program that we deliver currently our cultural regeneration program that was co-designed with um local communities and that was their vision of what they wanted um a city of culture year to to deliver for them and we committed to continuing to deliver that you know irrespective of the fact that we, we, we didn't hold the title. It was about ensuring those step changes and those really important outcomes um, that we, we stayed true to those. And what we have done throughout the whole process is shape shift and re-engage and rethink what had to be, um, you know, tweaked and changed and then quite radically changed within the past 18 months. But that level of engagement and touching base and ensuring that our plan was in the right track has, has really means um, our social renewal plan which has been delivered by the council and its community planning partners at the moment was what was informed by a massive piece of, of community engagement work um, the making of Fergusley Park another really fantastic creative engagement process to rethink um, the sort of urban redesign of, of, of Fergusley Park which has been um, which was for a number of years one of the most deprived areas in Scotland but a, a phenomenal really creative um, engagement process driven by artists and arts and culture um, and a really important network of, of third sector community groups is what allowed us to develop such far reaching plans and to be able to have a sort of clear plan of, of, of implementation. Um, what I would say is we've taken an approach where embedding arts and cultural practice in community engagement is just second nature and even from switching for example artists and residence programs to artists and residence programs mm -hmm. and in that absolute equality between our community and our cultural and arts practitioners and working so closely um, with our, the, the, the groups in, in, in Paisley and Renfrewshire who are really connected to the people that we most want to be able to give a voice and enable them to influence what sort of um, future policy making, what urban design, what community planning looks like in future. You know, we have got a network of phenomenal organisations like the STAR project, who, who, who facilitate that engagement for us and make sure arts and creativity is embedded within that. So for us, it's become second nature. And what we're starting to see now is the fruits for that, because the evidence of co-production and co-design co is all around. It's in the fabric of our buildings. Um, you know, our, our, our Paisley Museum Reimagined project has had that level of deep, deep, credible, really sensitive cultural engagement at its heart. And what we have created and what we will reopen is a museum that has been co-created by local people who are telling the stories of their own local history. So certainly for us in Paisley and Renfrewshire, I think we've, we've really managed to harness that in a way that's totally credible and true. Great. Um, Gail, did you want to come in there or, or uh, asking the, the other question? I'll let you move on because I know that you uh, yeah, take okay. your time. 
Okay, well, I think maybe just related, just on that, uh, related to what you just said, Louisa, there's a question around about, you know, following on from Gail's point, the pandemic has thrown inequalities into sharp relief. Uh, and how can the arts challenge this and help ensure we live in a more equitable society? So how might we respond to, to, to that question around about kind of the role that arts can play in actually helping us produce out of the pandemic a more equitable society? Big question. And oh well, let me start since I sort of asked it in the first place. Um, yeah, so, so probably a few of you have heard me going on about public value for some of the arts and culture can um, add to and how we use festivals and events to to leverage public value as a progressive opportunity. And I'm not for a minute thinking that COVID is a progressive opportunity, by the way, but what I you do look at a crisis and say, what do we learn from that crisis and how do we look at it? And one of the things that I said earlier, um, in case anybody missed that, was that I think what arts and cultural organisations, individuals and groups have been able to say is to showcase that these structural inequalities existed long before COVID and have actually heightened these structural inequalities. But that voice and often I think events and arts and culture are used in a voice of protest, in a voice of conflict and the arts are not necessarily just solutions but they're also a source of conflict and it gives us a, a space, um, not necessarily a physical space but an emotional space to be able to discuss what those conflicts are and those conflicts might be that structural inequality. So how do we how do we use them to redress that? Well, I think what's happened is that policymakers, politicians have all realized, and, and I'm not saying they didn't before, they did, but there are always other economic imperatives, but they've realized the value, the public value that has been gained in communities and society and tying into national agendas of health and mental health and wellbeing that the arts and culture have been able to leverage and that they've been able to, to use. And so I think now, and Louise, Louise is in that position, she is one of those um, in the local authorities in that policy decision-making role that says actually we can, we can shift this. We can, we can give money for the arts and culture to recovery in local groups. They can use spaces. I see some of the comments were about, it's not just outdoor spaces, there are indoor spaces that have been lying derelict or not used for years. We can revitalize them, we can use them, we can, make them free. We can uh, work in a way that has volunteers develop social economy skills. You know, Andrew talked about Coventry and the, the call for volunteers and people meeting you the way they did at London 2012 Olympics when you get off the train. We have welcoming cities and places and spaces. If people develop social economy skills, then they may get their first job if they hadn't had a job. The hospitality sector screaming out for staff now that, that weren't there before. You know, it, these these are things that we can start to look at to redress. There are bigger, wider issues of structural inequalities, of poverty, and as Andrew says, things like the food banks that maybe be working hand in hand with some of the projects and and groups like Star Group, uh, Star Project, who have been doing a phenomenal job of that um, in Paisley and beyond over the, the the past year and a half. I think we've seen many more examples of that, things of social bite, working in conjunction with Scottish Opera this, this summer where they're putting on outdoor performances and you can buy their picnic from them and contribute to charity. Again, another way that we would be seeing some of these changes. So I think there are higher level discussions that need to take place, but I think they are taking place at, at national government level, at local government level, about how do we redress structural inequalities, and, and this is an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And or Louisa, would you like to come in on that question? Um, no, not particularly. I, I think uh, I'm more interested in the, there was a question about international, which I think is uh, yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, so we were talking. We, one of the questions is was was how that Scotland and the UK may be in a better place to recover than many other places in the world. What could we offer internationally? So, um, would you like to take us away on that one, Andrew? Yeah, um, I mean, I I just feel you know the the UK um, it is hard hit by COVID. Obviously, there's been a huge amount of deaths and it's affected the economy and everything else. But that is but nothing to what 
is happening in Africa and India and um, other parts of the world. And uh, when, when I was sort of you know preparing for this yesterday, I um, I read something about this year being the the UN's year of creative economy for sustainable development. Now, what's happened to that? Where where has that gone? Um, and I do think when we're allowed to, we we need to think about uh, whether there's some of the kind of you know exemplary work at at a local level um, that could be transferred internationally. Um, you know, we're giving people um, uh, the the jab internationally, but what what can we give them culturally? What what can the UK share culturally given our resources? And um, I, I was fortunate enough when I was working for Hull um, to go and spend time in, in Sierra Leone, in Freetown, Sierra Leone. I've traveled a lot in Africa and worked in Africa, in South Africa and Kenya. But uh, Sierra Leone would make any of our high streets um, the worst high street in the UK um, look like Oxford Street in London. And um, we need to think what, you know, what it is that the UK can contribute. Interestingly, what, when I asked the question, what did Freetown Sierra Leone want? They wanted that an outdoor space, a pavilion. They wanted a kind of meeting place and, and there's some of the same human human needs and they needed kind of cultural projects that would engage with communities through film. And um, actually we haven't touched much on kind of film and broadcasting today. And I do think, um, some of the material that uh, has been produced through COVID and some of the kind of broadcast material um, has a longer home um, internationally. And I think some of the practices that have been exercised by good local authorities could be shared <coughs> locally, almost kind of in a toolkit format. So I think it's something for us to look at, not immediately, but, but in the longer term, what, what could we do internationally? I think what I think a really interesting related point to that, Andrew, is the kind of cuts that certainly university sectors faced around about UKRI funding on their global challenges uh, funding area, and many of these projects are actually working closely with uh, some of the nations internationally you're probably speaking with, and that's been really problematic. And I guess that ongoing kind of prioritization of resource is is part of this agenda that we've probably not also maybe talked about too much because I guess the fiscal challenges are significant and. And there's going to need to be influential um, actors in there lobbying for arts, culture, and many other activities. Um, I'm just aware that we have literally about ten minutes left, and I have another couple of questions. Probably, I think we're are, are interested for you to respond to. One is actually around about creative subjects. So, is and it's about the rhetoric. Is the rhetoric coming from Westminster about creative subjects, which is perhaps quite negative, harmful for a future that places arts and culture at the centre of the recovery, or can Scotland work independently? From this, what do we think about and about the kind of way that, that in the education context about creativity and creative subjects are being understood? Yes, and yes, uh, in, uh, UK government's got it wrong, Scottish government's got it wrong, um, but it could get it very differently. I mean, you know, it did invest in music education in a very big way, and then it's not free anymore um, across Scotland. So I, I think both are as, as guilty. Um, uh, go back and have a look at Ted Robin, uh, Ken Robinson's TED Talks on the importance of creativity in education. Um, he's been hammering on about this for 30 years and um, and sadly died recently. But uh, he his, his words will always kind of stick with me about the importance of, of culture and him ringing up a civil servant in the government and saying uh, why, how has drama got dropped off the curriculum? And uh, he said, well, it just has. And uh, he said, but, you know, William Shakespeare, sort of 400 years, um, isn't that quite important? Well, the no, drama's gone, drama's gone. Um, well, who said drama's gone? And it turns out it's Brian or some, some uh, person uh, writing a policy paper somewhere. We've got to, fight against this and we've got to fight against it um with politics but but uh scotland could be very different you know scotland has the ability to do things differently and it needs to exercise that ability and uh you know i'm hugely impressed by 
the Scottish government's in investment in culture, uh, but the education sector is a much bigger area, and uh, you know there's kind of other other issues that've got to be tackled in education in Scotland. But um, I think they could put culture even more centrally and really make a difference here. Yeah, I, I agree, but I would also just sort of reinforce that I do. Um, Guess I'm biased, but I do feel that in Paisley we're really <coughs> paddling our own canoe in this one. Um, in terms of <coughs> our commitment to free music tuition, <coughs> we've continued that. That's something that we feel is absolutely critical as a local authority, and we have continued to fund that. Um, our future Paisley programme continues to foreground arts and creativity and education, um, a wonderful partnership that we have um, with Glasgow School of Art. Um, to embed studio-based practice across the curriculum in Castlehead High School and that's now beginning to emanate now down to the rest of the Castlehead cluster so that would be all the primary schools and early learning centres that feed into that. We're seeing the developments with PACE around our youth theatre and you know the investment in a, a you know in the sort of first of its kind children's theatre that will be based in the heart of Paisley so in spite of the challenges and in, in, in spite of resource challenges you know you know uk wide um that investment in developing cultural infrastructure that supports young people's learning is continuing um here in paisley through our museum through our art center through our youth theater we have you know paisley community trust and their their, their proposition for community cinema um, and embedded in that um links into education and learning for, for, for all age groups um, th throughout Redfordshire. So I believe Scotland can and will do its own thing. And, and certainly here in Paisley, I believe we're, we're, we're building a, a blueprint for that. Great. Um, Gail, do you have a final, any final comment on that? Or will we move on to the, maybe the final question? We're going to move on to the final question. So I'm conscious of, that we've only got a couple of minutes. Yes, we've got the, just maybe just get one or, or two responses to, the, to this question, which was actually related to young people, because I think you know a number of people have mentioned that young people being particularly affected by the pandemic and mental health is key issue in that for, for those people. Is do we have any evidence or see that young people have become more engaged with arts and culture during this time? I think there's some anecdotal evidence, David, but it's again it's about that broad definition of culture. What we are looking at doing over the summer and now is really starting to develop um, much more evidence that actually shows how young people are, are, are engaging with culture and particularly how they start to re-engage with culture or continue to engage with culture over the summer period through the investment that we're making in cultural activity and play, you know, resources for, for, for children and young people to play and to really start to use that as a gauge to understand whether there has been an increase in, in engagement, whether there is a dip that we need to catch up, but to better understand. So at the moment, I would say we probably look um, don't have um, uh, exact evidence, but a lot of a lot of anecdotal um, feedback that would that would let us know that just through the virtue of the sort of the sort of blended learning that was put in place, etc., that has really encouraged children and young people to engage in cultural activity um, that they might not actually have realised they were that they were engaging. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that one of the one of the sort of topics we've covered quite a lot is 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 how we might define and think about what arts and culture actually represents. Yeah. And I know there was a question saying, does that you know do we need to redefine that post lockdown in the sense of what people actually engage in, and that might include young people and other uh, intergenerational groups that 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 actually and actually how also how we provide it because I guess much of this is because of the closure of of of. Um, various kind of venues and the like then arts and culture be experienced in different ways and it'll be really interesting to see none of us have a, have a crystal ball on that what, what that provision will look like uh, in the future uh, i want to probably just uh, uh, call this to a to a close as this first session and um, i want to thank very much our three speakers with a really positive interaction um, from the chat and um, people very positive about your your contributions I want to thank you all andrew uh, louisa uh, and gail for for taking the time and uh, we could have probably done another couple of hours given the sort of number of issues that have arisen some of these will be uh, discussed in the in the session that will be coming up a couple of sessions will be coming up in the afternoon 
so one on the kind of events and festivals specifically and the visitor economy and one on arts culture and well-being so i'd very much ask people who have joined us for this session to to come back at one o'clock for for that session when uh, it, it will start the first session will start and there'll be another session in the afternoon too um, at this point, before we close this session, I also want to just mention that, that um, CCSE is going to be hosting a future events panel discussion on the on the 23rd of June, a couple of weeks at, at three o'clock. And again, that's something that we would encourage you to to maybe um, join and register for, and um, which will maybe focus in a, a little bit more on some of the kind of digital environments around about events and what that might mean for the future of that particular sector. But at this point, uh, thanks to everyone for their participation. Um, and we'll see you all back um, at yeah at one o'clock for the the formal um, next start of the of the second session of the day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.